Hello Explorers, welcome back. So, this one is going to be a case. We are doing Bill Killer. Let's count the money first and then we'll talk about this case that we're going to get into. And let's hope that I don't royal, royally screw this one up. Um, I did a lot of this one from memory. So we have 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, 19, 20, 21, 22, 23, 24, 25, 26, 27, 28, 29, 30, 31, 32, 33, 34, 35, 36, 37, 38, 39, 40, 41, 42, 43, 44, 45, 46, 47, 48, 49, 50, 51, 52, 53, 54, 55. Um, and you know what? I'm going to go ahead and add to this. And the reason being, I had said I was going to be adding from, uh, collab pay. So let's go ahead and just, that way each one of these is $15. One, two, three, four, five. Right. Okay, perfect. All right, so this case is actually one from my hometown. Not technically my hometown, but my hometown area. So I'm from Northwest Indiana originally. Went to Chesterton High School, if you're familiar with that area. But I've lived all over because while other places have, um, like, different cities, Indiana just has a bunch of counties. <laughs> Um, and most of our counties are the size of most places, towns and cities, because we just have so many of them. So we, everybody that's ever lived there has lived in multiple different cities or towns or counties or, you know, everything. So this one, um, hits very, very close. And I will explain that as we go. Now, this one's a little bit different. Like I said, a lot of this is coming from my memory. And then I did look up some of the news articles to kind of jog my memory and everything. So, like I said, I hope I don't mess this up. All right. So, we have Amanda Alexandria Bach, born July 7th, 1992. So, she's a year younger than me. Uh, she was born in Crown Point, Indiana, which is Lake County. And that is important because in a lot of this, you're going to be dealing, in this case, you're going to be dealing with counties. So I'll try to mention, if I mention a city, I'll try to mention which county it is um, because they cross over so much. She was a recent graduate of Portage High School. Um, I was actually born in Portage and I went, I only went to Portage schools for kindergarten and first grade and then we moved to Chesterton. After I graduated, I got my very first apartment on my own in Portage. Uh, actually, like walking distance to the Portage High School. Um, so she was a recent graduate of Portage High School. It was 2011. I graduated 2010, so we were very, very close in age. We had a lot of friends in common. I did not personally know her. So she went missing um, very early Friday morning. Uh, September 16th, 2011. She was reported missing by her parents to the police after she missed her 1 a.m. curfew. Porter County Sheriff's Department found her gold Pontiac G6 around 3 a.m. next to Dean's General Store, um, just west of the main unincorporated strip of Wheeler. So Wheeler, Indiana is this tiny little um, town. <laughs> I did my vocational school there, so I did ha half day high school, half day vocational, um, and my vocation was actually at Wheeler. So Wheeler is actually kindergarten through high school in the same building. It is that's how small this area is. It has a population of four hundred and forty three people. Very, very, very tiny area, um, and they have there's like four streets of Wheeler. Um, so they found her gold Pontiac G6 around 3 a.m. next to Dean's General Store, west of unincorporated Wheeler, population of 443. When they found the car, the door was open, the hazards lights were flashing, like the emergency lights were flashing. It had a flat tire, and then once they got into the car, they found her purse sitting on the passenger seat with her wallet and ID still in it. Her cell phone wasn't in there but her wallet and her ID were. Um, 
Sorry, you guys know when I do these cases, it takes me a minute to like get into the swing of things again. So, um, she had last been seen a early Friday. So, I'm sorry, early Thursday. She was, her car was found Friday morning, so it was like 1 a.m. Um, she had last been seen around early Friday at a male friend's home. And Porter County Police and local dive teams searched near where the car was found, including a retention pond where they set up a command post. Now, at this time, I remember I was living in Hobart, Indiana, which um, Hobart, Indiana is Lake County. Wheeler is Porter County, but they're only a street away from each other. So where I was living at the time, I was about two streets away from where they had found her car. And it was, I mean, it was literally right down the street. It was, it, it was crazy. Um, so they had set up a command post. The search team included Porter County Emergency Management Agency, um, local firefighters, conservation officers, Lake County Sheriff helicopter, hundreds of volunteers and friends and family. Um, so when they put together this search party, I planned on going to it. Um, I had so many friends that were in, uh, that were very close to her. She went missing right down the street from my house. So I planned on going to the search party, but I had to work. Um, so I couldn't go. And I, I remember feeling terrible. Like I, I was going to call out and then I thought about it. And I was like, there might be people that I work with who actually knew her that might need this like need to call out so it really wouldn't be fair if I called out um and I didn't know her so that was the reason for that um around 3 45 p.m uh Saturday so the following day Amanda's body was found near a set of railroad tracks less than 300 yards away from her ex-boyfriend Dustin McGowan's home so Another little key, or not really key, but another little fact is that Amanda at the time worked at the Portage Quaker Steak and Lube. Um, and I actually interviewed to work there at the same time. So she was already working there. She was serving there. I had a friend, a close friend of mine that was working there as well. And she was like, hey, we're hiring. I know you're looking for another a second job. Why don't you come apply? So I applied. I went in. I had my interview and everything. And I was just waiting to hear back um, kind of when everything happened. But at the time, she was a server there. Um, so they found her car less than 300 yards from Dustin McGowan's home. She... Sorry. They found her... See, this is where it's going to get really, like, chaotic. Because, again, I'm doing a lot of this from memory and not from... It's not all brand new to me, so I apologize. So let me start that part over. Around 3.45 p.m. Saturday, Amanda's body was found near a set of railroad tracks less than 300 yards from Dustin McGowan's home. Dustin McGowan is her ex-boyfriend. They dated for like two year, two and a half years on and off, um, and they had recently split up. She had been shot in the neck, which sever severed her spinal cord, um, which caused her to... She basically succumbed to the injury immediately. Uh, she didn't suffer or anything, thankfully. Now, McGowan is the son of a Crown Point police officer, Joseph Elliott McGowan. Um, at the time, Officer McGowan refused a search of his property, which is pretty suspicious, obviously. Um, but they did end up searching the home on Sunday they didn't say what was found. I don't couldn't find and I don't remember them ever saying if they found anything like within the residence. Um even during the uh trial, I don't remember them bringing that up. So, I like wrote down notes so that I would remember to go in order. Um on after they found her body, 
the Indiana University Bloomington Campus Police um, took McGowan into custody and then he was transported to Porter County Sheriff's Office. So Bloomington is a couple hours south of where they found her, where they found her her car and his res like his home. So he had gone down to Indiana University to um, party with some friends. And so he was he was picked up down there and he was transported back to Porter County Sheriff's and he was being held in connection with her murder. They launched the Porter County Sheriff's Department launched a full investigation into Dustin's dad, Officer Joseph McCowan, for his possible role in hiding evidence such as the weapon and her cell phone. Um so Officer McCowan had actually after they found the body he had um, reported that his gun was missing. One of his firearms was missing. So when they did a little bit of an investigation into the firearm that he claimed was missing, it just so happened to be that the bullets it took were the same bullets that had been used to kill her. They obviously couldn't say for certain that it was his gun because they never retrieved the gun. They also never retrieved her cell phone. Those were two things. The cell phone was not in her car or in her purse. It wasn't on her person when they found her body. They never recovered that cell phone. And then they never recovered the firearm. So Porter County Sheriff's Department, which he worked for Crown Point Police Department. Crown Point Police Department is a city. It's it's a town in Lake County. Um, Porter County is where all of these crimes took place. And that's where they launched they are the ones that launched an investigation into um him in connection because the prosecutor her parents and porter county sheriff's department believed that he was hiding key evidence such as the cell phone and the weapon and that he helped cover up the murder they just couldn't prove it but there was an investigation that launched by them they also said that at any time if any evidence would come up or if anybody came forward with any information that they would reopen that investigation at any given moment um they did end up having to close it because they just didn't have sufficient evidence or anything that proved their theory so it was unfortunate but because we we all know if you're from the area you know he 100 percent helped his son he was very uncooperative and there was just too much circumstantial evidence to believe anything other than the fact that he was involved in the cover-up. Um, so during the trial, um, because again, he was charged with the murder, uh, Dustin was. So during the trial, prosecutors had three pieces of evidence placing Dustin near the area of her car and body. Investigators used GPS to track McGowan's cell near um, the area of her car and body. Sorry. Investigators used GPS to track McGowan's cell near where her body was found between 1 to 3 a.m. on September 17th, which would have been Friday. The coroner puts time of death between 1 to 2 a.m. on September 17th. So they were able to basically say he, because of his cell phone activity, he was in the area of her body between 1 and 3 a.m. And she died between 1 and 2 a.m. Um, they also had bloodhounds um, that traced Dustin's scent from his home to where her body was found. And this is completely irrelevant to, oh, I guess, you know what, we'll just take it from this one. This is completely irrelevant to this case specifically, but the detective that is putting out all of these statements is actually my husband's uncle um, on his stepdad's side. So this is how small town this, this stuff is. This, is. this is where we're from. It's all small town. Bet you can guess why we had to get out of there. So I think I'm just going to stick to the cards, but we will shuffle them. Uh, just so that I don't have to pay attention to the, the, the dice. Um, so Bloodhounds Trace McGowan sent from his home to where the body was found. And then one of his neighbors, um, Nancy Phillips, 
she said that she overheard what sounded like a male voice in the early morning hours saying, um, where did I put it? Um, Amanda, get up. Come on, get up. Get up, Amanda. Around five times. Um, she did report this. However, her husband, uh, I can't remember what they said his name was. Mr. Phillips said that he didn't hear anything. He didn't see anything and that he's never seen any problems with Dustin. And he just doesn't believe that Dustin could have anything to do with this. So they were kind of a split household on that information. Um, many of Dustin's fr closest friends, including his best friend, stated that they believed he was responsible for her death. Um, basically when they split up, Dustin was blaming Amanda for coming between Dustin and his best friend, Brandon. He had recently texted or he had recently told Amanda to stop texting him because she was ruining his friendship with Brandon. Supposedly Amanda had a thing for Brandon. Brandon did not have a thing for Amanda back. Um, and the, this is all coming from Brandon, the friend. Brandon stated that Amanda wanted to date him. He wasn't interested in dating her because he didn't want to screw up his friendship with Dustin. Um, and that, but Dustin still took it that way anyways, even though nothing ever happened. Um, and so he was blaming Amanda for basically ruining that. And then Brandon's mom said she considered Dustin to be like her own son. They had been best friends forever. And she believed that Dustin definitely was responsible for Amanda's death and that um, she thinks he just felt like he was losing everybody that he cared about and that's why he did it. So that is that. Um, eyewitnesses claimed, an eyewitness claimed he saw McGowan walking in the same area around the time of the murder on the main road between the store where Box car was abandoned and McGowan's home. So he said he was 2000% certain that he saw a young man around the age of 20, um, early teens to early, or, I'm sorry, late teens to early 20s walking around the area at 2.30 in the morning on Friday morning um, near the store where the car was found, uh, like between the store and his home. So that was kind of an eyewitness. Now, do I believe he did this? 1000% I do. And I did the entire time. Um, if you were living in this area at the time, there's no doubt in your mind that he did this. However, I think eyewitnesses are very um, unreliable in small towns simply because everybody is so quick to get into everybody else's business and just to insert themselves in things that it's like, it's almost, I hate to say this, but it's almost like there's nothing else to do in the area. And so when something big like this happens, even though it's not anything positive, everybody wants to insert themselves. Everybody wants to be a part of it. Um, it's good. It's always a positive thing in the sense that um, like search teams, um, volunteer search has a massive turnout because again, nobody has anything to do. So in that sense, it is very positive. The turnout for the search for her was hundreds, especially in a super small town where there's only a population of 443 people. But on the downside, people believe they see things. People call in for every little thing um, just because they don't have anything else to do and they want to be a part of it. And so in that sense, it really can hinder an investigation. So while this eyewitness has stated that he saw McGowan walking um, in the area, at the same time, McGowan was texting his friends. So we got a 10. He was texting his friends that he was at home, which obviously GPS shows he really wasn't at home. He was in the area of the car. And then you have this supposed eyewitness who is stating, you know, he's, he's not at home. He wasn't at home. So, um,
In February of 2013, nearly two years after her death, Dustin McGowan was convicted of her murder. In March of 2013, he was sentenced to 60 years in prison, which is nearly the max sentence he could receive. Um, in 2018, a settlement was reached with Amanda's parents and Dustin's father, Officer Joseph McGowan. They sued him for failing to properly secure his firearms, resulting in their daughter's death. Um, the whole thing is just tragic. Uh, there's not, because there was never any kind of like show or, sorry, I was looking at that, because there was never any kind of like show or anything, like there was no snapped episode, there was no, you know, investigation discovery episode or anything like that on this case, you're not going to have the same kind of like history, um, that I would normally give you or detail that I would normally give you on cases. The only information information you're going to find about this case is what family and friends have put out and then what the local news stations have put out. Um, for so, Well, for us, this was a huge thing. This isn't something that happens in the area that we're from. Um, it's not considered that anywhere else. So it just doesn't get the attention that it would get in other areas. So nine. Um, so yeah, that is, that is that case. I went through it a lot faster than I do normal cases, even with stumbling quite a bit. But I remember at the time I had picked up, I, I was friends. I was, I did a lot of stuff in my late teens that I'm not proud of. Um, that I look back and I'm like, wow, I was an idiot. Um, but I remember at the time when she was missing, I had went with another friend of mine that I worked with to go pick up a male friend of mine from the airport in Chicago. And when I did this, I did not really know this guy. I had met him. Um, I mean, everybody kind of knows everybody in that area but I had never like personally met him I had been texting him for quite a while we were friends on social media and everything but looking back like that was just so stupid um and it turned out he was actually friends with Dustin and so I remember sitting there and like talking to him about it and then I remember later on being like you what were you thinking like what were you thinking so I put myself in a lot of um, situations that were not the best. And that just goes to show that as teens, we do not think your, your critical thinking skills, your brain is not fully developed. We may know right from wrong, but we still make some really dumb decisions when we were teens. Um, that is not excusing what he did in any sense whatsoever like there's absolutely no excuse for what he did I'm not even trying I'm just talking my own personal like experience and like thinking back to that time and oh crazy I remember almost being scared after the fact like at the time I wasn't scared like hanging out with this kid or anything like that um I was with another friend when we hung out with him that was not a rule um, but I remember afterwards, like once, because at the time it was like at the very beginning of this investigation and everything. And I remember being scared afterwards, like just thinking like, wow, that could have not ended the way that it ended. What was I thinking? So I think that was like the last really stupid thing that I did. So... I hope that I didn't leave anything out. I don't think that I did. Um, by the time the, the trial came around, I was living in Miami. So I wasn't local for the trial. 
Uh, my husband and I had moved. Well, at the time he was my boyfriend, but you know, you know. All right, I think this, I probably should have forgot to, um, forgot to shuffle these again. Okay, so we'll do this now that I'm done with the case. I think it took me longer to write all that case down than it did to even go through it with you guys. But now that we're done with that case, I'm gonna go ahead and roll. So let's do, let's do the D10. Nine, energy. And I know you guys have asked what I'm going to do with Ford since I don't have a car payment anymore. I got a lot of really good suggestions. Um, I know Ange Budget and Debt said that I should keep it as car for like a future car. Um, that I never even considered that. That's a really good idea. I never did consider it. But um, I think I'm not going to do that just because uh, we didn't buy this truck brand new. So... Um, rather than focusing on like saving for a new car, like another car, the next car, I want to make sure that we have money in an emergency fund, like a car maintenance. That's a nine. So I think what I'm going to do for right now, it's just going to say saying board. Um, but I think I'm going to eventually switch that to grocery. I'm just not reprinting it right now because my printer's down. Um, eight is cell phone. And honestly, I know someone said don't switch it to grocery because you're trying to fill mortgage. But then I thought about it. And I was like, you know, the thing is, once if it gets filled, it's just getting reallocated into mortgage anyways. So I guess it really doesn't matter what it is currently. Because until mortgage is done, everything ends up getting reallocated. Nine. We are putting a lot into NB Energy. Six is car insurance. I feel like, I don't know, I feel like not, what didn't get a lot? Maybe trash and gas, three, gas. Gas didn't get a single dollar, did I really? I feel like I had to have messed that up, I probably did and you guys are probably yelling at me. That's okay. Uh, six is car insurance. Eight is cell phone. Which, um, my husband needs a new cell phone so bad. But we're looking at switching our phone plan. 10 is car payment. Here we go. Okay. So let's go through here and figure out what we're putting into everything. Like one, two, three, four dollars going into trash. So now trash has 19. Okay, so there's that one. Gas got a whole dollar. <laughs> so it has 21. Which... Oh. Okay. For some reason, I thought these were $3 a piece. I was like, wait a second, why do I have so many colored in? Because they're $2 a piece. Water got $4. So in water, we have 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17. So do I have too many colored in? 3, 6, 9, 12, 15, 18. 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17. So I had too many colored in on water. 
I think I colored these as though they were 12. They were worth $2 each. So we owe this a dollar. Okay. Internet is getting one, two, three, four, five, six. So for sure we get to color one in. So it's got 27. And we are one dollar shy of coloring in another one. So this will definitely get to color in another one next time. And we're going to start, I think, cash stuffing this more often. Um, I'm trying to figure out, I'm kind of changing up my finances a little bit. So we'll see. Progressive is getting one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. So it's got. 33. 33. So we have 5, 10, 15, 20, 25, 30. I need to adjust so many of these because my progressive is no longer $100, it's $138. HOA is getting four dollars. So it has twenty-five. So not quite. ATT is getting one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. So there's thirty dollars in ATT. We do get to color one in. Like I said, my husband needs a new phone, but I really just don't want to, uh, I don't want to take on a, a higher phone bill, but he definitely needs one. His has been paid off for a while, so I guess he's done his part with not adding to our phone bill for long enough. I'm the one that always has a payment due on my phone. Envy Energy is getting one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Ooh, that ISO shot up there. Sorry guys. So it's getting ten. So it now has thirty dollars. So we do get to color one in on Envy Energy. Ooh, we're coloring in so many exciting Ford is getting one two three four five six seven so 22 so we do get to color one in here like I said this one will get We'll change this one up, but for right now, we're just going to leave it until I'm ready to redo the entire binder, I think. Because I do need to update this whole binder. Should have done it at the end of the year, but oh well. And then last but not least, mortgage is getting 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12. 13, 14, 15, 20, so $70. Not enough to, so in total in mortgage we have 1,000, 1,500, 1,600, 1,700, 1,800, 1,900, and $70. So we are $30 away from coloring in another house and putting it into the high yield. So that is it for the Bill Killer True Crime Binder. Um, I know Busy Lizzie over, or Lizzie over at Busy Lizzie Budget is still doing her True Crime Binder every Wednesday. So you should definitely go check out her channel. And I will see you guys back here for my next video. So until next time, bye.